Welcome to stage three, the PRAC model of the reflective practice paradigm. We'll be looking at the embarking reflective practitioner and trying to show you different ways of actually assessing reflection at this stage so that the student becomes an expert synthesizer and evaluator of experiences. So at stage one, we actually asked um, you to think about some trigger questions to help the reflection process. And then at stage two, we ask that you actually apply some um, systematic methods in which the student can actually start to relate some of their deeper understandings in relation to their reflections into academic um, forms of assessment. And then in the third stage, what we're asking you to do is to try to help the student create a bridge between their theoretical knowledge the, and their real world context so that they we enliven an internal emphasis or reinterpretation of knowledge. So in other words, it's just them saying, I knew this already, but I now have a different perspective on this. Aside from the PRAC model um, being an anagram for the words process, report, analyse and continual learning, it also is meant to have three other connotations. The first being that it's meant to allude to the real world practice of reflection. So the prac component is about when students are actually in a practical setting, they should be applying the prac model to their reflections. The second aspect that this anagram is meant to represent is that reflective practice is something that practitioners do. Expert practitioners will undertake the reflection um, process during different stages of their career and you know at different times during their working day. The th this leads into the third point which is all about reflective practice needs to be practiced. It needs to be something that we make time to do and it's not something that we're ever really expert at but with time and energy and consideration of the process we will get more expert at reflection. And that's the key part about this particular model, and that is the actual process of reflection is probably the, um, the key aspect of stage three, where it, this is how it differs from stage one and two reflective practice models. And that is that we need to draw attention to the student on when to reflect on action, in action, and for action, and what particular type of reflective process and model is most appropriate for each particular situation. What I'd like to do now is quickly show you the steps that you might consider taking in guiding the reflective practice process for your students using the PRAC model and stage three of the reflective practice paradigm framework. In guiding reflective practice, the first step is really about trying to say to the student, you need to understand that reflective practice is a process during which your perspectives might shift. This is a really important point. So we ask students to consider the reflective practice to perhaps make sense of new and sometimes disorienting professional situations. They might want to use it to undergo a self-examination of their skills and knowledge and attitudes in relation to their professional environment. They might use it to self-assess their internal thoughts. They might use reflective practice to relate their experiences to others and to recognise differences and similarities or to explore options for new ways of acting in professional environments. Sometimes students use it to build confidence and competence in the placement role. Some students just use it as a what to do next, so they're really focusing in on the situational analysis and then the now what phase comes in there. And some students use it to restart the ongoing process of reflecting for learning and for transformation. This is really a high level uh, reflector here, but as you can see, there are a range of different ways in which students can use the reflective practice process and learn from that um, while they're on placement. The theory on reflective practice is also really important. So there's a suite of videos that we have available that will help you and the student understand what reflective practice is, how to begin the process. There's some examples of student reflections. Uh, there's videos on the different aspects and elements of reflective practice. So these are really there as a, um, as a library of tools for you to use and to contextualise to your particular unit. And students find this really useful to just go through these little cloud concepts at, 
in their own time at their own pace to try to understand the reflective practice process in more detail. The third step in guiding reflective practice is to ask the student to actually review and revisit the rubric, or some students like to call it the marking guide, on what reflective practice might look like in terms of the elements and the levels required to be a high level reflective practitioner. So this will help them guide their own reflective practice thinking and also their recording, their evidence of their reflective practice process. What we find is that students actually find it really difficult to find the right moment from their placement to reflect upon. So step four is about saying to them, find a time when you perhaps maybe felt disoriented and overwhelmed or surprisingly welcomed, proudly empowered or alarmingly disempowered, found yourself questioning previous assumptions and beliefs. Uh, did you find yourself engaged in interesting, in interesting conversations with colleagues and the, their discussions and interesting viewpoints made you think beyond where you, where you would normally think about um, those issues and situations? Did you experience a new skill or process that really made you think in a different way? Uh, was there a moment that you thought more critically about a series, a series of events and a culmination of little changes? This is also really important to piece together little sequential moments during a placement and what that means from a big picture perspective. Um, or did you gradually notice a change that occurred or a change that still needs to occur? Remember that reflective practice can also be about the gaps and what's missing. Step five is actually about getting the student to begin the practice of reflective practice. So what I like to do is to get the student to engage with other students' work, have a look at their examples and just give it a go and create this as a formative assessment item. So students need to feel safe when they're first reflecting within a unit and with a particular academic uh, that what they're going to be submitting is not necessarily going to be part of their final assessment um, mark. So it's really important to have some formative assessment moments infused somewhere throughout the unit so that you can hopefully build them towards being that expert practitioner and so that they feel more confident with their honest reflections when they're submitting those, the edited versions, at the end of their portfolio. So once I've got them practicing the process of reflection, then I introduce them to other materials and other uh, students' work that it's at a higher level so that they can start to model what an expert reflective practitioner may look like, may sound like. So it's really important that a student is able to delve into this in their own time, but they need to see different ways in which others have reflected in order to perhaps hone their own reflective practice. So step seven is about saying to the student, okay, you've, you've provided a piece of work to me for formative assessment, I've given you some feedback, now's an opportunity for you to actually edit some of that if you choose to. So your final reflections uh, should be edited versions, they not, do not necessarily need to involve all of your own uh, very personal thoughts, but they may not also involve some of the things that you thought you might might not have got quite right at the formative assessment stage. So it's really important to reiterate to them that it is an ongoing process, that the editing part is really important, and that the feedback mechanism within the reflective practice process is also really critical to their learning and their transformation. I think the other important thing to reiterate to the student is that it's a challenging process and when if you have time with students to actually undertake the reflective practice process yourself, so you're modelling your own reflections in class or in online discussions and forums, you'll show the student that it's never um, a complete process in the first instance, some things need to be edited, it's never perfect but it is a challenge and hopefully in that challenge there is some real learning to be made, some deep learning and some transformational learning that um, occurs as a consequence of taking the time to decide what to reflect on and how to reflect on that and what artefact to represent that reflection and that learning uh, in the portfolio. So I've suggested some of the areas that you might want to include when you're guiding the reflective practice in your unit. The next eight to nine minutes is about showing you some reflective practice artefacts that students might submit 
during a placement or a project uh, to reiterate the PRAC model. And then I'll finish with the rubric again, just to show you the key elements and the levels that are involved in a PRAC model reflection piece. So uh, eight to nine minutes for the next phase and hopefully you found this useful. Before your placement, you'll begin your round one reflection assessment of your learning outcomes. What you need to do is decide whether or not you think that you're at the HD standard, so somewhere in here, or if you're at the median competency standard, which is somewhere in here, or if you think that you're at the novice standard. I tend to find that students tend to put themselves somewhere in these two, two categories, but the most critical thing is that you actually say why you think that you're at this level. That's what's really important, not the score that you give yourself, but the things that you say about your IT competency or your architecture competency or whichever discipline you're from. So what did this student actually say about themselves? They said, I have self-evaluated my rating to be a 3.5 because I understand many, but not most, areas in IT. But I have trouble explaining IT knowledge sometimes. As I have no IT work experience at the moment, I feel that I don't fully understand the relevance of IT in society and in, in a business environment. This student's given themselves a 3.5. Probably with that sort of analysis that they've given themselves, I'd probably be sitting them in the 2.5 to 3 category. But as I said, it makes no difference what score you give yourself. What's really important are the things that you say and the things that you need to learn to develop during your placement. From here, you'll start to analyse your skills. So the most important thing is that you actually give yourself some opportunity to think about all of the different skills that you need for your role. For instance, are there some generic skills that you think that you might need to focus in on? And then you assess why you think you've got a certain level of, of say, teamwork skills. Your value awareness, so what sort of at attributes do you have? This student said they're keen and eager and they've got a willingness to learn. Great attitudes to have when you're out on a placement and then articulate that in some way. You can focus in on what this student had to say about those two items if you want some time to think about that. All of this sets you up for trying to develop your goals, your step three in your portfolio. So this is where we need to focus in on the goals that you'll be wanting to complete by the end of your placement. There'll be discipline specific goals, so hard skills. This student's talked about translating web design into websites and also Drupal. In addition, there's some generic skills that you might want to think about considering um, for development during your placement. Teamwork, communication and meeting deadlines were three that this student wanted to focus in on. In your degree, there will be some theory that you need to uh, draw upon in order to complete your placement at a professional level. This student has focused in on professionalism. And the final fourth goal area is your project specific goals. These are really important to add into this point because this is when you're going to be having a meeting with your supervisor in the first week and just making sure that these project goals are still on track for your placement and that they will be achievable for you during your placement. If you are at any point thinking that these goals might change in the first week, that's absolutely fine as well. So this student sent me a template of the goals that they wanted to achieve for their placement. Some were skills, some were very specific project type goals and others were relating to the DGLOs. The reason why you do this is so that in your logs you can actually start to show me how you're tracking against your goals and this will come about in your outcome section of your goals. So what did you achieve in relation to your original placement goals? Make sure that you map them somehow. This student said improvement on Drupal competency, which he's put as skill one, and working towards goal one as well. So that's all you really need to say. Just make it top level information only. Keep the tasks uh, pretty straightforward. Add a description if you want. And then the other part is that 
you need to sort of total how many hours you've worked on your internship for that week. But the focus for me really should be about this outcome section here, how you're tracking against your skills and your goals. You can also include some digital, um, visual displays of how you're tracking against your goals as well. So this student's just done some snapshots for me of some of the project stuff that he's been working on and included that in his logs. So what are some examples of getting the student to reflect before their placement, during their placement and after their placement or their project? We might begin by asking them to answer one of the threshold learning outcomes. Do they have a coherent understanding of IT? What you can also do is provide a little rubric for them on how they might respond to that and a level that they might give themselves. What I find is that students really value um, these quantitative measures when they're beginning to reflect it helps them to situate where they think they're at then they can actually get into providing a, a qualitative response in response to the question about a, having a depth and breadth of IT knowledge a student might respond by saying something like I have self-evaluated my rating to be a 3.5 because I can analyze my choices when it comes to preparing an IT solution and sometimes improve on my choice or even realise a better choice after looking at the problem from a different perspective. I know I'm strongly opinionated when it comes to how I solve a particular problem, but again, due to a lack of work experience, I haven't been able to apply my knowledge into complex real-world applications. Students might even respond by saying something like, um, I communicate well with others about technical details and if another person is not tech savvy then I will try and use an example or approach from a different perspective. This will be the skill that I hope to improve the most upon during my internship. All of these opinions or qualitative responses can be backed up by allowing the student in a portfolio approach to provide evidence of particular jobs that they've done where they've evidenced their communication skills or whether or not they are IT savvy etc. So we might find different ways in which a student can respond to this and, in, and for example we might even get them to do a detailed assessment of their skills. So when they're reflecting on each of their skills they need to give some detail around you know why they think they're a particularly strong at you know teamwork or why they're partic particularly strong at their commercial awareness for instance. Students might provide reflections in, in their logs, for instance. Uh, they might use goals to actually situate how they're actually going to and when they're going to reflect. They might provide examples of the work that they're doing and whether or not they found these tasks challenging or in any way difficult. They might just want to just give you a weak progress report. They might want to do a video log. Uh, there are lots of different ways in which we can get students to reflect during their placement. These are just some of the examples. One of the useful tools for evidencing uh, learning and students' reflections is actually uh, the supervisors, the industry supervisors' evaluations of the student's performance. So this is another layer that the student can add to their reflections and it, it's another way that they can add another point of view and the opinion of others uh, and in addition to their theoretical underpinnings for their reflections they can actually use real world examples of what others think of their practice as well uh, incorporated into their reflections. So this is a really valuable process in the entire reflection process within a portfolio approach to reflecting at the third stage.